show me the law. on my gasoline and for my property I tax on all the things I buy and when I go out to eat Sherry Jackson, Aaron Russo, Robert Schultz and Larkin Rose, Erwin Schiff and Joseph Bannister showed we all paid through the nose There are millions that have seen freedom to fascism this year So you better turn around and get your butt right out of here 2,000 pages in a book the IRS's code When you read it very carefully You'll find that nothing's old I did a little research Till I found income to find Well, I ain't no corporation So leave that argument behind Yeah, you can stick your chest out You can prance and you can strut But you better do it someplace else Before I kick your butt Show me the law The Congress and the Senate know the facts But they won't lift a finger, no, they won't stop the income tax They've got their corporate buddies making fortunes from a war To them, deaths are statistics, and they're just keeping score I don't like intimidation, and I refuse to live in fear I suggest you quit your job and go and find a new career you say it's voluntary, like when you stop at a red light But that law is written in the books, it's there in black and white If no law says that we must file an income tax return Let's get all those 1040s, light a match and watch them burn Your income tax extortion plot won't work with me no more So you may as well forget it, turn around but there's the door, show me the law
you got that on uh, tape, right? Yeah. Very good. Uh, now, let's give credit where credit's due. Who was it that, that wrote that? Dave Von Kleist. Dave Von Kleist. Great song, great job. And that's the theme that we have today. Show you the law. Show me the law. I'm going to show you the law. I found it. They've been hunting all over for it. And uh, I found it. And so we're going to get into that. However, this seminar, I think you got a little too much ring there, don't you? This seminar is um, uh, divided into three parts. The first part is the foundation. You will not be able to understand. <coughs> You'll be looking right at the law and not know you're looking at it if you don't have the foundation. You've got to have this foundation first. So we're going to spend uh, the first seven hours on the foundation. It'll only take about an hour to discuss the law itself. And then it will take another couple of hours to show the remedy on the law. And um, the, the law and the remedy on the law, I think, will be quite apparent if you have a good foundation. So pay attention to that foundation. That is really, really important. Took me many years to focus in on it. Took a lot of bad decisions. You know, we got a lot of experience here. Where did that experience come from? It came from bad decisions. Okay. Experience comes from bad ex decisions. So we've made our bad decisions along the way. We got the experience. Now we can make good decisions based on that experience. So anyway, um, show me the law. Now I want to get into the uh, very important here. Uh, is that coming through on the screen? Does everybody read that? Maybe what I ought to do is um, make it a little larger. I think I can uh, do that. Here we go. How's that? Can you see it now? So this is the foundation. What you see here, by the way, is on the website, 1215.org. Okay? This is the Nitty Gritty Law Library and Sovereign's Paradise putting on the show here. And... Um, uh, <clears throat> This foundation, if you get this foundation down pat, you pretty well have got it knocked. You can, you can pretty well handle any situation that comes along. However, handling any situation coming along does not mean you have a license to harm other people. This is all premised on you being legally right, lawfully right, and morally right. If you don't have all three of those factors down, then you've got a problem. And uh, if you are, it's possible to be legally wrong. You can be morally right and lawfully right, which means common law right, but you could be statutorily wrong. Well, the statutory wrong, that has to yield to the common law. Okay, so if there's a conflict between the common law and the statutory law, the, the statutory law must yield. Now you see, if you look at the, uh, at the codes, the codes say, particularly in California, I think it's the, uh, either the Civil Code or the Code of Civil Procedure, I forget which, but I think it's 22.2, .2, which says basically that, uh, that the common law shall be the rule of decision unless, or so long as it's not, uh, in conflict with the statutory law. And that is true if you're in the statutory house. If you, if you set up your case to operate under statutory law, then that's how it's going to be. But in truth, the common law takes precedence if you start off in the common law house and use it. But we'll get into that. Anyway, the first thing I want to cover is attitude. This is really, really important. Um, if you, um, if you have a bad attitude, if you have an attitude where you're always angry, you're always upset, well, obviously, 
court procedures won't be fun. And let me tell you something, court procedure can be lots of fun, especially if you're in charge. And um, you, but you have to have a good attitude. If you have an angry attitude, this will work against you for a number of reasons. For one thing, people start off simply not giving you the credibility. For some reason, anger reduces the credibility, the perception of credibility on the part of other people. So you basically have to be a very calm, very uh, friendly kind of person, regardless of the issues that are going. So you, um, plus if you are a person who is emotionally locked up, and you're into anger, or if you're in any emotion, strong emotional position, be, the, be it happy or angry, you will be blinded to your opportunities. You will not see the opportunities that are there because of how your mindset will color your, your ability to perceive. I'll give you a common example. Uh, I'm sure that everyone here has had the experience of buying a car. And after you bought the car, did you notice how many other people had a car just like yours on the road? And they all came out at the same time. Until you bought that car, you never really noticed, right? You ever had that experience? I said, oh, I've had it. Well, what happened was that before your mind wasn't channeled. You got channeled on that car and bam, and you just, every time one went by, you noticed it in the beginning. So your mindset uh, very much controls your ability to perceive. So the proper mindset, if you really want to do law well, is you've got to neutralize yourself and be open to everything. Don't be automatically rejecting things just because they conflict with whatever you're seeing or thinking or whatever. Um, and by the way, this rule that I'm giving you applies to attorneys too. And the beautiful part is, is every attorney that I've ever had to deal with um, had a mindset that I was absolutely ignorant because I'd never been to law school and didn't know anything and they took liberties and they weren't sensitive to the stuff I put into the papers and then wham they get it <laughs> in the end you know and the very common thing that I hear when I go to court is the attorney says to the judge he says your honor I don't understand this paperwork well the judge understands because he went through corrective schooling commonly known as judges seminars you know, they, they have programs where they teach judges what the real law is because somebody's got to keep the system straight. And, uh, and they do. In fact, um, I've noticed a remarkable consistency in the codes. And I know the attorneys aren't that smart. And I, I wondered for a long time, how is it that they passed all these laws and had it right? Well, you look at the, the, the legislative procedure and what they do is they pass it through to the legislative committee. And so one time I went up to uh, the Capitol in Sacramento and I thought, boy, this is an opportunity. And I went to the legislative committee's offices and I happened to get a hold of a supervisor. And so I was all ready to, I was all primed to ask the supervisor about the process they went through and how they reviewed it and, and so forth, you know. It took about 30 seconds for me to realize this person didn't know the fir didn't have the f first clue of what the real system was. So I had to change my program. And what I did was I asked the person, I said, well, could you explain the procedure? Just exactly what happens when a, a proposed statute comes to your office? What, what is the next step? And she says, oh, well, what we do is we have a meeting with the judges from the Supreme Court <laughs> and, they, and they critique it for us as well. And we, we work it out in a committee, in a meeting. So there you are. Here I thought that the fountain of knowledge would be in these legislative committees. Turned out they didn't have a clue. The real fountain of knowledge is, is with these high-level judges. They know. I've never had a problem with a high-level judge. They, you know, they, I may have had problems, but they're all legitimate problems. They, the, uh, they understand, they're well-educated, they're intelligent. These guys know. And if you get your act right, you'll get the results. So, um, again, its attitude is very important. When they perceive you as basically a good guy, that's what counts. Um, there was a, um, 
uh, a um, in I believe it was Thailand, the uh, the person that was head of all of the Buddhists in Thailand. Um, Thailand was a real interesting country. If uh, if you were a bother to the government, you just simply disappeared somewhere around midnight of one day. And that took care of the problem as the government perceived it. And um, uh, this, uh, this particular Buddhist was a real big, big problem to the government, and yet he had a minimal security force. And everybody wondered, how is it that when, it, that when the customary way of solving problems was to just make the person disappear, this guy seemed to be immune. And uh, the answer was that this man was the Buddhist, uh, the head of the Buddhist group, uh, was just a wonderful, likable person. Everybody loved him. And he was invited to high level functions, you know, parties and so forth. There was nobody that disliked him. And nobody wanted to kill, a, kill him. I mean, you know, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he was a big pain to the government, but not a personal pain. Okay, very important lesson came to me out of that, and that is, make sure you're likable. I'm friendly to the judge. I'm friendly to the judge uh, to the uh, attorneys. You know, I uh, I have to admit one of my moments of glory was when I had an attorney screaming at me so loud that you could hear the echoes off the end of the hall that was 300 feet away, but. Uh, that was a rare opportunity. That doesn't happen every day. But, uh, um, but even that guy liked me as a person. You know, he was just angry because he wasn't getting what he thought he should get out of the courts. Um, but it's very important to have the right attitude. Get the clerks to like you. Those, you know, people don't have an ax to grind against you when you first walk in. But if you show an attitude that's bad, you can generate dislike, you can generate lack of cooperation. And I can tell you that some of the best research we've ever had done was done by the clerks themselves to help us. It's just amazing because they, they really liked us. They, they perceived us as good people. I go in, I talk to the clerks all the time, and, and I do talk to them, you know, on a personal basis. And it's, hi, how are you? How's the family kind of thing? And, uh, and you tell them a joke or something. My favorite joke to tell them, and this always works, and I've never found a clerk that's heard it before. But I always tell him about this tremendous uh, uh, effort that somebody put in fighting his, his parking ticket. And the, the, uh, the, the, the judge, you know, was really, really getting tired of the, the major battle that this guy was putting up for it. And he says, finally, he said to the guy, he says, he says, sir, this is the judge speaking. He says, sir, he says, didn't you see the sign? And the man said, well, yeah, Your Honor, I saw the sign. It said fine for parking. <laughs> I tell you, every clerk loves that joke. And uh, in fact, everybody in, the, in, the, in that business loves that joke. So, uh, it, and it's a good way because then they start, they start cooperating with you. You don't look so much like a kook. Remember, you're doing some very, very strange things. At least they look strange to these people, even though we have hundreds of years of tradition behind us. It looks strange to them because they're simply not taught. The attorneys are simply not taught this stuff. They, they have no clue. And coming from you, well, you have no authority as far as they're concerned. You know, what, what do you know? But you know a lot if you follow these procedures. So I'm just emphasizing this is, attitude is a big, big factor, much bigger than we really anticipate. And we get a lot of behind the scenes help from people that we could never prove we were helped. But I've seen judges do 180 degree turnarounds mysteriously. Just there were tigers on the bench and suddenly they became like kittens. They were very nice and cooperative and so forth. Part of that was because of the fact that we fenced them in with the real law. But a big part of it also was the fact that they liked us. In one case, we had, I remember this judge just absolutely raking the attorney over the coals. It was spontaneous, you know, we weren't expecting it. We didn't even have any motion that was even close to it. But this judge went into a tirade against the attorney and told the attorney, you know, that the attorney was the one that was responsible for the delays in this case. And the, the attorney wasn't doing her homework and the attorney wasn't doing her research. And I mean, he just went on and on for about five minutes on this attorney. 
And, and this was an attorney who had five years of experience in the court system. And, uh, and, but uh, I mean, when we went into that courtroom, we always said, hi, Your Honor, and nice to see you and so forth, you know, and then we got down to business, of course. But on a personal level, it, it was just fine. And I know that these people will stab you in the back first chance you get, they get, you know, but uh, uh, they, 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 when, they're, when they like you, it takes a big chunk of energy out of their, their, uh, their sails there. Yeah, wind out of their sails. So this is, uh, uh, attitude is not law directly, but boy, it sure can have some surprisingly good effects if you have a good attitude. Okay, well, enough of attitude. Now we have uh, language and dictionaries. Now, language and dictionaries, basically in America, we all speak three languages. We, the the uh, low-level language is called slang, okay? That's the language of the street. It changes from moment to moment, from block to, bo to block, okay? So, um, um, and slang has some very interesting uh, uh, features in it, you know? you. You say you see a lady that comes into the room and she's really dressed hot, and you say, "Boy, she's really cool," <laughs> you know. And 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 we have funny things in our language like that, but that's slang. That's not formal English. So the formal English is our second language, and and in order for strangers to communicate, we have to be educated in in formal English or business English, if you want to call it that. And so that that's a, an important language too. But it is a separate language, even though it's also called English. It's a language that's separate from the slang version. And then there's the language of the court, sometimes called the King's English or legal English. And that is, that's a very, very stable language. That, you know, a word means the same thing today that it meant 300 years ago. And um, presence is very important. And the, the legal dictionary is far larger than Webster's unabridged dictionary. If you, the legal dictionary, uh, if you go to the law library, the legal dictionary is not called a dictionary. It's actually called words and phrases, okay? Or you'll see that it's uh, the restatement of the law. That's another name for it. Or American jurisprudence. These, these, are, all, these are all dictionaries, as far as we're concerned, dictionaries of the English language. And if, I remember the word to, spelled T-O. I remember it took several pages of court cases where battles were fought over the meaning of the word to. It really surprised me when I first saw that. So be sure, when you, when you are using the language, be sure that you're speaking the right language and you know that language. When you, uh, one exercise that you could do that I did is just sit down with the Constitution and one of these dictionaries and every single word, just pretend you never saw the language before, and every single word, no matter how simple it is, you know, what it starts off, we, W-E, look it up. You'd be surprised what that word means when you're talking legal language. And uh, so if you did that, that would give you a tremendous uh, uh, force, you know, uh, intellectual force behind you to, the, to make you more effective in writing your papers. It also makes you more effective in, in undermining the opposition because often these attorneys, you see when the attorneys go to law school, sure they're taught a few meanings and so forth, but they're not actually told that it's a separate language. They don't realize that. And they will go in there, a lot of times you'll hear attorneys on the floor of the court speaking business English. You know, you can just chop them up with, with uh, if, you, if you pretend that they were speaking legal English, you can really screw them up, okay? They, uh, because they don't know, they're not educated. Um, attorneys are remarkably ignorant. I, I don't mean to downgrade attorneys because I'm not saying they're dumb. They're very intelligent. A lot of them are extremely intelligent, okay? But being intelligent isn't good enough. You also have to use the right words. If you don't speak the right language, you can get in trouble in the courtroom. Um, I think a, a very common misuse of word is the word resonance, okay? You know, uh, you ask anybody on the street what the word resident means, 
And resident means, well, you know, you live there, you, you, you belong here, right? That's your normal meaning for the word resident in, in everyday English. But when you get into the courtroom, the word resident means you're a foreigner and you're here for a specific purpose. And once you accomplish that purpose, you're going to go home. If you're a resident of California, that means you're from some place outside California. And you've got some purpose, and they assume it's a commercial purpose. Why do they assume it's a commercial purpose? Very simple. The Constitution of the United States authorizes Congress to, to regulate interstate commerce. And so if you say you're a resident of California, that means you're from outside the state, you've crossed the border, you've got a commercial purpose, and therefore they're entitled to regulate you. And that's by authority of the people who gave them the Constitution. So very important to understand that word resident. Now, if you don't want to be a resident under those terms, the proper word is domiciled. Okay? If you're domiciled, that means you belong here. You don't need any excuse. This is where you live. This is where you belong. But if you're a resident, I'll show you an example of a common use of the word resident that is proper, that does match up with the legal meaning. And that is where a doctor does his residency in the hospital, right? He went to school, he got his MD, but he's not allowed to practice medicine, not till he completes his residency. So he goes into the jurisdiction of the hospital, crosses the border, he now subjects himself to their, their instructions and, and command. He goes through all the hoops that they, that they have him jump through. And then once he completes the program successfully, he leaves. He leaves the hospital, goes out into private practice, and he, com he has completed his residency. So there's a, a, a really good example of, of what residence means. So anyway, make sure you get your language right when you write your papers. And please, please pay attention to your spell checker, okay, on your, on your word processor. If you, put in, if you put in paperwork with misspellings I mean, some of the stuff I see is pretty sad. And believe me, when you put in bad uh, spelling, the opposition looks at it and they figure, one way or another, they're going to beat you. You're too ignorant. Okay? So you can't do that. If you, if you have trouble spelling, for Pete's sake, go down to one of the secretarial services and have a, hire a secretary to read your paperwork and correct the spelling and correct the language. You know, sometimes we use slang without realizing it. So uh, a, a good executive secretary can do a lot to save your paperwork from, from being disrespected. Okay. All right, let's get into the meat of this. People or citizen, which one are you? Okay. Well, let's see. Fortunately, <clears throat> this one's not working right. Okay, well, anyhow, uh, Back one yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. I don't know. Can you read that? Kind of hard to read from back there, isn't it? Sure. Okay. Well, anyway. <clears throat> Basically, the people own the country, and the country owns the citizens. That's the basic relationship. So which do you want to be? You want to be a people, or do you want to be a citizen? You cannot be both at the same time. However, if you're one of the people, you can choose when you want to be a citizen. You can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for, for other purposes. Now, how do you know whether or not you're a people? Well, if you look at the preamble, well, let's back up. Let's go into the history. The, when the United States declared its independence from uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, King George wasn't too happy about that. And he got a little bit uh, uh, vindictive about it. And so he retaliated by canceling the charters that were granted giving the government governmental age or giving the colonies official recognition he canceled those charters so the result was is that 
technically speaking, there was no sovereignty, no sovereign law. So everybody was became self-governing. We governed ourselves. So everyone became sovereign. And so um, when, we, when we finally got together for this modern constitution, I know we went, we went through a phase, the colonies put together the uh, Articles of Confederation, but that, that, was, that was the business of the colonies, not the business of the people. So when that wasn't working out, the people themselves stepped back into the picture. I mean, this is all theory, but it's theory that, that uh, we generally accept in legal circles. And so we, we, the people stepped back into the picture, took command of the situation, and redefined the system. And so, uh, and this is expressed in the preamble. If you look at the preamble, it says in the preamble, we the people of the United States, okay? That we the people stepped in. Now, uh, what we did, we had a purpose. We said in order to form a, a, a well, we said where we're from. We're people, we're from the United States, and our purpose was to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves. <laughs> to ourselves and our posterity. And what are we doing? We, are, we ordain and establish this Constitution for whom? For the United States of America. So we the people were from the United States, which is two words, and we ordain and establish this Constitution for those guys over there called, four words, United States of America. So. You see, we were basically the creators of the United States of America. And uh, the word ordain means to authorize, to make law. So this is the law of the people speaking. And we, by, our, by ordaining, we created this whole thing in the legal sense. And then we establish this constitution. And the word establish in this sense means we actually put it on paper. We wrote it. Okay? So we've, we the people authorized it and we the people established it, wrote it, so that there wouldn't be any confusion, I presume. So I want you to notice those words, ordain and establish. The people were sovereign, self-governing to begin with, and there is nothing in the word ordain and establish that says that we gave up anything. We were sovereign before we created it and we're sovereign after we created it. So we the people gave up nothing. Well, that was a tough thing for the politicians to swallow, okay? And over time, that was not really compatible with, with what they like to do. And uh, because governments like to grow and grow and unfortunately they don't know when to stop so they grow to the point where they consume their own people. But this constitution was written in such a way there was no authority on the part of the government to do anything with the people. The government was a separate entity with its general functions but there was nothing in the constitution that authorized the government to take control of the people. So they had to do something about that. It took a long time for them to figure out what to do, but eventually they figured it out. They came up with this device called the 14th Amendment. Now, if you look at the 14th Amendment, I think I have it here. Well, somewhere here. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for it for some reason. I'm looking for the actual quote, the actual. Okay, there it is. Okay, the 14th Amendment specifically says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. You see, 
You're not a citizen of the United States unless, unless you meet two basic conditions. The first condition is you have to be born here or naturalized, one of those two, but that's the first condition. The second mandatory condition is that you have to be subject to the jurisdiction. Well, if you're born here but not subject to the jurisdiction, then you're not a citizen of the United States. What are you then? Well, you're one of the people. The people are born here, but they're not subject. It's quite the opposite. The government is subject to the people. Okay? We, the people, ordained and created or, or ordained and established this constitution for those guys over there. Those, by the way, they're not really the government. The true government is the people themselves. We are self-governing. The proper terminology, although we call the United States of America organization a government, it's actually a government agency. Okay? You notice they're all called agencies? That's because they're our agents. They're the agents of the people. They're carrying out tasks that we have uh, mandated that they do for us if they want to get a paycheck from us. Okay? So, uh, when you're a citizen of the United States, you become property of the United States. You have no rights, by the way, as a citizen. All you have is privileges granted by the government. But anyway, that's the, the background on that. Okay? Um, so, if you're going to be uh, um, one of the people, you have to know the difference between that and being one of the citizens. Now, you can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for other purposes. After all, if you're in your so sovereign capacity, you have the, the power, the legal power, to decide when you will or will not go into a contract with another party. And the federal government and the state governments are nothing more than other parties, okay? So, and, and this is how they, they get you. You know, you sign the 1040, there's your contract, okay? There's a number of things you contract, but these contracts do not grant general jurisdiction over you. They only grant jurisdiction over you for the purpose of that particular contract. If you have a driver's license, that does not mean you have to pay taxes. It does not mean you have to do a number of things. It only means that you have to have the driver's license according to your contract with them when you're doing the activities covered by that license. By the way, does anybody have a driver's license here? Okay. Pull it out and look at the back of it and see what it says. You might be surprised. It's in tiny print. And a lot of people cannot read small print. Okay. What does it say? Somebody read it out loud. <laughs> what? 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 This is. I'm talking about California driver's license. This license is issued as a license to drive a motor vehicle. Right. It does, it does not establish eligibility for employment, water registration, or public benefits. Right. It doesn't establish. Uh, this license is only valid for driving a motor vehicle. You ever wondered what a motor vehicle? Now we're going to talk legal language here. You know what a motor vehicle is? A motor vehicle is a self-propelled contrivance used in commerce. What does used in commerce mean? It means carrying passengers or cargo for hire. Right. If you look under... First of all, if you look at uh, under California Code section, I think it's 15210, that's the one that says that the California definitions shall apply unless there's a federal definition. Okay? So, California is not being subjected to federal jurisdiction. It's the other way around. California is volunteering into federal jurisdiction. So that's not an issue about whether or not there's federal, federal jurisdiction. It says specifically in the code that, yes? I have an Arizona license. Okay. Like okay, it doesn't have it on the Arizona license, but they issue that license for 40 years, don't they? Um, let's see, yeah, it, it, they, they issue them for 40 years in Arizona. Yes, ma'am. Um, five years. Oh. I got it in 08. Yeah. 
expires in 2013. 2000, five years, okay. Well, years. But I. For the microphone, they ask the question. Yeah, that's true. Go ahead. You mentioned about motor vehicle. I have this from Valentine, which is James Valentine, the brown little motor. Okay, now Valentine's Dictionary is not law. It's a very good resource, but it's not law. Well, let, let, let me put it in mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. And get close to the microphone there. Okay. On a motor vehicle, uh, Valentine says, see in a motor vehicle. So the first one is on, on a motor vehicle. Uh, if you cannot understand my pronunciation, I'm sorry. I'm from the Philippines, okay? Um, and then Valentine said, see, in a motor vehicle. Now, in a motor vehicle, it's a price indicating a relationship between a person and a vehicle, such as riding in a vehicle or being in the process of entering or leaving the vehicle, but not limited to one sitting in the vehicle in the place provided for accommodation of driver or passenger. 29A, AMJ, Rev, Do, Da, Da, Insurance, whatever. All of that is interesting, but the fact of the matter is, is that you you go to when you want to get these public officials under control they are obligated you're not but they are obligated to ob obey the statutes and you don't need that dictionary because we have it specified in the statute exactly what a motor vehicle is and right. it's got to be a self-propelled contrivance used to carry passengers or cargo for hire and if it's not doing that it's not a motor vehicle it's that simple you don't need the dictionary Okay, but uh, I forgot. Good morning, Mr. Bell. I'm Good sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I'm here to insert a lot of things on my discovery myself. Sure. Um, uh, I want you guys to know that Mr. Bell is a wonderful one foundation mind, which is the last source, which is the common law. Common law is execution. You have to know that. That's I the paid you for this, by the way. That's the absolute. <laughs> but uh, before we get to the co common law, which is the execution, which is dollar for dollar, teeth for teeth, we need to learn from the beginning. That's why I, I've been studying too. Um, Mr. Bill is uh, twist me quite a bit, and uh, for doing that, I uh, I sharpening myself more hard than that. So I'm, I'm very grateful to Mr. Bill helping me out and uh, showing me about what really what the uh, the book, the dictionary, the Inkara, the Bovier, and name it. You cannot just pick one A book. Well, you, let's uh, yeah. let's move on on this because uh, there's a uh, well. I'm sorry, Mr. Bill. Let me just put this. There's another on the bottom, in and on the body. A praise used in an indictment charging the use of an instrument in an abortion or attempted abortion, state versus long streets. Uh, we need one another. I need you, Mr. Bill, and you need me. You know how, how intense I do study. And I have my uh, uh, discovery a lot to uh, connect it to all the dots that we create and I create. Well, Aurora, let me, uh, let me just cut you off there because, um, yes. Thank we, you, sir. We, we need the cooperation, as you point out. But uh, we're, we're on a very, very narrow road here uh, to accomplish what we're going to accomplish. Um, so. Well, that's why I make the narrow more wider and clean now for the rest of them. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the, um, uh, if you look at, at the definition in Section 15.210, the state has volunteered into federal jurisdiction as far as definitions go. And by the way, all the states that receive federal highway funding they have to meet federal standards. 
And so one of the federal standards is Title 18, Section 31, which has definitions. And in there you will find motor vehicle, two words, specifically defined as a self-propelled contrivance that's used in commerce. And then if you look further down in, in uh, Section 31, you will find where the phrase used in commerce is specifically defined as carrying passengers or cargo for hire, or something close to that anyway. So um, if you're not engaged in, in some form of, if you're not driving a motor vehicle, then uh, you don't have a license to do what you're doing if you're just traveling, and then you don't need one. Where's the jurisdiction? So the cop out there on the street, he doesn't know he doesn't have jurisdiction, but he doesn't. Not if you're not engaged in commerce. Now every trucker out there who has a driver's license who is carrying passengers or cargo mm -hmm. for hire, yeah, he's subject to the rules, okay? And that's constitutionally authorized by the people. So just have a clear understanding whether or not you're, you're using this vehicle in commerce. It's not good enough to be a vehicle. It has to be a motor vehicle to be in the jurisdiction. Okay, so, yes, sir. When you get a driver's license, then you're asking for a license to do that. Are you now that not alleging that you are? No, the license is only for the license is only for that activity. Okay, there's nothing in in the licensing process that says that now you have to have it for travel. It all it's all commerce. I don't know if you've noticed it, but the uh, motor vehicle department is under the tax collection department. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, FTD. So, uh, yes, sir. Bill, does the uh, does if, you, if one does not get a driver's license just based upon your your discussion, then is one still obligated to obey the laws, the speed limit laws, and, and no, no. But you, you have the common law obligation to not endanger others. Okay, and you, you have a common law obligation that if you do get into an accident, you, you are responsible if, if you uh, basically acted irresponsibly as, as considered by a jury of 12. Yes, sir. Are you going to bring the birth certificate into this scenario? Am I going to what? The birth certificate. Are you going to bring that into this scenario? Well, the birth certificate is, is uh, title to the body of the, of the individual. And uh, there's a lot of argument there, but look, uh, on a practical level, if I go into court, I make my claims, whatever they are. And I got some very, very good advice one time from this fella. His name was uh, Abraham Lincoln, okay? I know a lot of people have some opinions about him, but he, he, he was an attorney. Okay, and he brought out a very important point, which is if you don't want to argue a point, don't bring it up. <laughs> okay, don't put in your papers that I reject the birth certificate, just don't even mention it, even if you have one. <laughs> okay, if they bring it up, well, sure, you attack them on it, but hey, you know, there, there, there's just too much. If you tried to cover everything, you just your papers will become like encyclopedias. You can't do it. So just bring up the, just stay close to the issues, whatever they may be, okay? So, um, um, okay. So back to which one are you? Uh, whether you're one of the people or one of the citizens. So if you're one of the people, you own the government. If you're one of the citizens, you are subject to the government. You're subject to the whim of the government. So um, um, you don't have any rights when you're a citizen. Why? Because you're subject. You know? You're, 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 you must conform to whatever the rules are that they've laid out for you citizens. So a citizen does not have a right to own a gun. Okay. I know that's a big issue with a lot of people, but a citizen simply does not have a right to own a gun. He has a privilege to own a gun. It's a legislated thing, okay? And there may be legislation somewhere that says, if we haven't legislated it, it's okay for him to do it, okay? 
but basically, uh, it has the privileges. Citizens live by privilege granted by the government. And by the way, they don't like to call them privileges. That might wake the citizens up and get them to thinking about being people. But uh, uh, so they they give these privileges a special name. They're called civil rights. Okay, civil rights are actually civil privileges granted by the government. What if you want real rights? They're called natural rights that you're born with when you are one of the people. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, what is that here? I didn't understand you. Oh. Is, the, is the microphone off? It's I'm, off. I'm not up there, so. Hello. Okay. Um, talk about gun. You said you cannot uh, own a gun when you're a citizen. So what year was that? No, I didn't say you can't own one. I said it's not a right. Oh, okay. It's a privilege granted by the government. But you could. Okay. That's if you're a citizen. If you're one of the people, it's definitely a right. Well, if you're a citizen, you cannot have a gun. That's what you say. I didn't say that. I said you don't have a right to. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, now, I did. the okay. general policy of the government is that if you're a citizen, you may have a gun. Then I must be a people since 1980 something, because I owe a 9 mm and a two barrel shotgun. No, I wouldn't be bragging about it. Well, no, I'm saying I don't have those. I get rid of those because okay. I know my temper. I don't want to be part of that. Yeah. You know. But basically, it. I. I just want you to have it clear that citizens, if you look at the. The 14th Amendment, it very clearly, very simple words, it says to be a citizen, you have to be born or naturalized and subject. If you're not subject, then you're not a citizen. Okay? I think I just understood you on my point. Mm -hmm. There is no law that requires... Get closer to the mic. I think I just... Is it on? I turn off the mic. Uh, there's no law that requires the people you got to get close to that mic. It's not picking you up. You, you can even raise it up. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? There you are. Now you're directly Boy, I'm on it. touching it. I don't know what's going on. But, okay, I just understood you. In other words, there's no law that requires the people to file. But there is a law that requires a citizen to file because it's a privilege. Right. You'll see that the, when the statutes are written, they refer to persons, not to people. The word people is not the plural of person. The plural of person, singular person, is persons with an S. Anybody remember the O.J. Simpson trial? Mm -hmm. you, remember, you remember the Fourth Amendment issue, the exigency that was being considered in, in the uh, municipal court before they transferred it to the superior court? That, that, uh, that judge, she was... Uh, I don't think she was smart enough to write that opinion. I think somebody helped her on it. But when she read the decision, uh, which essentially a lot of people said suspended the Fourth Amendment, when she read that decision, she was absolutely on target. She never used the word people anywhere in that decision. She referred to person or persons all the way through from beginning to end. She had her language right. And, and, uh, and when you understand that citizens live by privilege, not by right, she was right on target with that decision. There were a lot of attorneys criticizing her, and those attorneys were wrong. <laughs> now, if O.J. Simpson's attorneys had the understanding to take the position that he was one of the people, that might have had a different outcome. <laughs> but anyway. They don't teach that in the school. They don't, teach, they don't teach it in school, no. Nope. Okay, so um, that's basically it. Okay, uh, I think it's time for a uh, five-minute break. You want to take a break here for five minutes? Okay. Start it again here? Well, take your seat. Order in the cart. Okay, uh, 
I have to put the appropriate hat on to talk about this subject. <laughs> okay. What we're going to talk about is. <laughs> I just got a quick question. Yes, sir. In terms of the 14th Amendment, so would it be correct to say that as a, a person who was domiciled in California, uh, born and raised in California, that I am one of the people of California and, non -re and a non-resident foreign to the United States government? Is that yeah, you, don't, you do not have to accept uh, U.S. citizenship. You know, you can, you can just be a resident. Remember, the true country is California. And, and uh, the United States of America is merely a, a corporate trust. I mean, it, you, if you look at the preamble, it has every element that you would expect to find in a trust. It has the trustor, the trustee, the beneficiary. It has the, uh, the purpose. Everything's in that, in that little short paragraph, all the elements. And, so the, and you can tell that the United States of America is actually a corporation. The way you can tell is very simple. It has a president. All corporations have presidents. Countries have governors. Because, because they have a governor because he's, he's acting in behalf of his, their, peop their boss, which is the people. Hey. Great. You're welcome. So anyway, um, what we're gonna talk about here is the Bill of Rights. Now, if you're one of the people, you've got all rights. Okay? I mean, when you, when you delegated authority to the United States of America or to the states, you delegated that authority, that didn't, you gave up nothing. You're still sovereign. Okay? So and we'll get into sovereignty in a little bit what sovereignty is all about. But I want you to know that if you're one of the people, you have all <coughs> rights. Whereas if you are a citizen, you only have certain rights. Now, I, did you have a question, Aurora? Uh, yes, Mr. Bill. Uh, what do you mean by wearing that hat? I don't understand. Well, I'm an American. <laughs> and I'm talking about citizens and people. And this is part of the entertainment. You don't want a boring session on law, do you? <laughs> Come on, we got to have a little sense of humor here. Well, you know, sometimes Aurora is a little girl. I don't understand. I yeah. have to ask. No, it's attitude. You know, you got this. This whole legal process should be fun. Okay, you got. You, you, if you if you're if you're steeped in, in anger, and and all serious, uh, I'm sorry, but you're shortchanging yourself. And oh no, I'm very happy and I'm very inspired. Good. Well then, so I, I take, I take, uh, I, I'm wearing this hat now, mainly for fun. Okay. You should, you should it, put it does not mean that I'm Napoleon and crazy and I've got some strange concept that goes with it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you put a gauge on me, you see what my, my magnetic field is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Can you go up to the microphone? Oh, no, that's fine. Can we bring the microphone to her? No, no. Can we bring the microphone to her? Uh, Mary has a knee problem. And that's why. Yeah. Put that gold fringe around your hat. Does it have a gold fringe? I didn't notice. <laughs> I'll put I'll put one there in the future. <laughs> All right. Is it on? Is it on? It's on. Okay, because I don't hear it coming through. Okay. Hey, Bill, is that better? Yeah, you got to talk right into it. Okay, the Fourteenth Amendment has not been ratified, so how can we have the Fourteenth Amendment? Okay, the Fourteenth Amendment has not been ratified. I don't think I have the microphone on here. I think we need the microphone. How's that? And also the 16th. Okay. The issue that has been brought up is that the 14th Amendment has never been ratified. Let me tell you something. That's not important. Okay? Um, we're, we're dealing with, let's put it this way. When you go to China, if you were in a Chinese court, do you think you would argue your case in English? Or would you argue your case in Chinese? Chinese? 
Yeah, you want these people to understand you. Now look, I go into a courtroom and I know the attorneys, the clerks, the public that's out there watching what's going on, they all believe that the 14th Amendment is valid. And maybe even the, 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 uh, the judge, he may believe that it's valid, okay? He may be poorly educated as a judge. Um, so I play the game. And I'm going to play the rules as much as possible according to their understanding so long as it doesn't give up my rights. Now, if it gives up my rights, I'm going to educate them, all right? But as long as their rules help me, I'm going to use their rules. I'll apply them. And so they think the 14th Amendment is valid, so do I, okay? And I'll use their own words against them. So the 14th Amendment says that you have to be born or naturalized and subject. Well, I'm not subject. That's what they believe in, and they believe in that word subject. And I'm telling them, I'm not subject. I'm over here, over on the preamble. Okay. So, again, if you don't want to argue a point, don't bring it up. You can develop a whole case on whether or not the 14th Amendment is valid. For what? <laughs> you know? It doesn't apply to me anyway. Well, I'll let them have it valid. Sure, it's fine. It's valid. Okay. It doesn't apply to me because I'm over there as, as a people. And I, I choose not to volunteer into citizenship, not for that purpose. You can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for other purposes. What's that? What's subject? No, subject means that they have a, it not, that's not a noun, that's a verb. You're subject to the, you subject yourself to their jurisdiction. You're subject to the jurisdiction. So I guess that's an adverb, isn't it? Subject myself to the jurisdiction. Well, if you subject yourself to the jurisdiction, then you're granting them the authority. Okay. You're the source. Well, that's that's a separate issue. That's not down on this line of thought, but yeah. Yeah. The, com the, uh, the requirements for citizenship are that you have to be born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction. If you're not subject to the jurisdiction, then you're not a citizen. And so, and it's, it's your choice. This is a free will choice that you can make. And of course, they schnooker you into making the choice they want you to make by simply regulating the education that they give you when you're in the public schools. Okay, they don't teach you the words of freedom. They teach you the words that subject you, that put you into their jurisdiction. So they don't teach you, they don't, they, they, all you ever hear when you're, you're in the school area is you hear about uh, being a good citizen. You hear about being a resident. You hear the word resident used all over the place. How often do you hear the word domiciled? Okay, but the word domicile is the one that gives you the freedom. All right. Then you have uh, uh, another interesting thing is, is that um, you'll notice that in all the public schools, you have to register. <clears throat> Your children are registered into the school. Instead, of, they used to say enrolled. <clears throat> now they say registered. What's the difference? Mm. Well, registration, <clears throat> excuse me, registration is when you register something that came from the outside the jurisdiction. Enrollment, you already belong in the jurisdiction. We're just putting you on the list. But registration is when you're outside. You ever heard of a ship's registry? Well, the ship is registered outside the jurisdiction. Okay. Ships go into other jurisdictions, so they have to register. So um, when you enroll, you're from here, the jurisdiction that you're enrolling in. That's why they say registration in school now instead of enrollment. And, and of course, the people are not well educated, so they uh, sometimes mix these words. 
Yes. Oh, this is a T-shirt with your subject. You're not a citizen. I didn't say that. I said it the other way around. If you are subject to the jurisdiction, and if you are born here, then you are a citizen. And then when the got mild, he asked me, are you a citizen? I said, that's what you said in my passport. You don't say, well, you're going to get it. That's right, because you are a citizen. Yeah, she had an experience with the judge, and the judge, I guess that, it was a judge, right? No. No, it was it. Was he part of the about, was he part of the prosecution? Yes. Okay, he prosecuted her. Asked her, you want to know if she was a citizen. You'll notice that on the um, on the uh, criminal papers, the charges or whatever it is that they generate in the, in the uh, uh, district attorney's office, you'll see that they'll put your social security number and your uh, driver's license number on there. Okay, why? Well, that's proof you're a citizen. Okay, prima facie proof, by the way, which means that you can upset that assumption. They'll make the assumption until you counter it. Okay, with your counterclaim. Okay, we'll get to that. That that's part three. Okay, so I just want you to be aware of the difference between people's rights and citizens' rights. Now, I went to a book. This book is published by the Senate of the United States. They, the Senate gives a free copy of this book to every senator, every congressman, and to the vice president. Why doesn't the president get one? He wouldn't read the executive branch. Yeah, the, the, the president's in the executive branch. The vice president is part of the Senate. He's the president of the Senate. And so he gets a copy. Now, this book is called the Constitution of the United States of America, Analysis and Interpretation. Okay? And that's a very interesting book. It's got some 3,000 pages almost. And if you go to um, the book, which is called Senate Document 99-16, on page 956 and 957, footnote 12, <laughs> you will see a list of the privileges uh, that are available to citizens, okay? So for example, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights is available, religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. The Second Amendment is not available to US citizens. Quartering of troops, there's no cases, but they decided to throw it over on that side anyway, <laughs> okay? Uh, grand jury indictment, you're not entitled to a grand jury indictment. You're not entitled to a jury trial in civil cases if you are a citizen of the United States. And you're not entitled to, to bail necessarily. And you're not entitled to protection against excessive fines or equal protection, okay? All of those are not available to the US citizens. That's the, the second, third, fifth, seventh, and eighth amendments, the Bill of Rights. Uh, on the other hand, they have legislated that you are entitled to the First Amendment uh, Fourth Amendment protections, uh, Fifth Amendment uh, double jeopardy, self-incrimination, and just compensation, you, you, and the Sixth Amendment protection uh, has been so much diluted, but the Sixth Amendment, you are still uh, legislatively entitled, entitled to speedy trial, public trial, jury trial, impartial jury, notice of charges, compulsory process to get witnesses in, and, and a right to counsel and you are entitled to uh, protection against uh, cruel and unusual punishment. So that's the list right there, it's right in the Senate book. Okay, I love that book, it tells the truth. Now it isn't that they, they don't want it, it isn't that they don't want to lie. Yes? Um, on the book that you just said, uh, how would you read the United States? How would you read What book? I don't know, but that's not important here. It's important to you, but it's not important here. Okay, because the reason it's the reason it's not important here is because you're in your sovereign capacity. I hope, 
And, and in your so sovereign capacity, you can change these rules. No. Well, in Congress, the United States is our bold letter, bold capital I. It doesn't make any difference here. If you're in your sovereign capacity, you're above the Constitution. So they play their game any way they want. You, you are Aurora. People, we are brothers and sisters here. Aurora, if you want to put yourself under their jurisdiction, then all of that becomes important. <laughs> Okay. Well, I can't. I can't just say I'm Aurora if my full letter name is capitalized and one is capital lowercase. And then what's that fit? That's why that's confusion. Well, you're you're confused, but I'm not. Uh, no, I said confusion. I'm not saying confusion. It's all right, Aurora. It, we're we're not. I'm well, telling you. Doesn't matter. It's not important. Yes, sir. Well, well, every once in a while, they they publish this book, okay? I think the first one was published back around 1910 or something like that. And it comes out every so often. Uh, there's been as few as, as, I think, three years between publishings, and there's been as many as 25 years between publishings. But every once in a while, they come out with it, a revised edition. And it basically brings in new court cases and that have affected and so forth. It's a very good book, actually. And, uh, but if you lay down, and I've done this, I've taken a very old copy with a very new copy, and I put them side by side, and you can see that the language that they use, they don't change the concepts. But what they do change is the wording to describe the concepts, and the newer books make it easier to misinterpret. The older books were clearer, were more clear, okay? And, yeah, obfuscation. And you'll also notice that in the old books, if you look in the index, there's almost a full page of references to the common law. And in the newer books, there's zero reference to the common law. It's still in there, by the way, the common law. If you know where to find it, it's still there. Now, the beauty of it is this, is that this book... I've got on the website, okay, and you can search it, <laughs> okay? There is a search engine on the website, so you can look up stuff, and it will lead you to that book, okay? So that's kind of neat. Bill, how often is that book updated? Well, like I said, I just said three years one time, another time is 25 years went by. You know, it depends on what the urgency is. I think the 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 the, the three-year inter interval was somewhere around uh, 1938 or so, right in that era. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I brought with me some CDs. These CDs, you'll each get a copy, and it's an exact duplicate of the website. However, the one thing that's missing from it is the search engine. That's not on there. However, Windows, if you're using Windows, has a search engine in it. So you can look for words, keywords in the files. So we'll give you a copy of that. Does that have a driver to chart it up? On that? You put it in, it automatically comes up. If it doesn't come up, there's instructions on the front of it to tell you how to get it started. Okay, so, all right, so that's people's rights versus citizens' rights. <clears throat> now let's get into sovereignty, okay? Now let's see. <clears throat> I need to, uh, it's very important to be sovereign, okay? If you're not sovereign and you decide to be a citizen, this is how you might end up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think you want to be like this. 
So I, I suggest you be sovereign. It's a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable. Okay? But anyway, we're going to talk about sovereignty. Yeah, this is the carrot top box. Uh, enough of this. Here comes the gold There you go. And here, Aurora, you can wear this. That's the Queen's. You like princess. Well, princess can wear that too. Still royalty. You're still royalty. <laughs> Anyway, any lady in this room is entitled to wear this. Did you like to wear it? There you go. No cross-dressers, please. <laughs> I guarantee this lady is not a cross-dresser. No, <laughs> okay. Very good. You look beautiful on that. She looks great with it. Yes. Where's the camera? Put the camera on there. There you go. <laughs> so we're going to talk about sovereignty. This is a major, major point. Now, as I've mentioned before, we were without law. And so uh, we were self-governing 100%. And then the, the colonies got together and decided to uh, form an organization themselves. And so that was the Confederation. And you had the Articles of a Confederation to, to set the rules. Well, that didn't really work out as well as, I guess, uh, some people wanted. So we had our Constitutional Convention and uh, revised it considerably and came up with the Constitution. So in the Constitution, if you read the last part of the Constitution, you'll find that the, uh, the people had decided to have to use this Constitution, but it would only be put into effect if nine of the states, nine of the colonies would agree. I guess they were states by then. And so when they got the nine to agree, then it was a go. If they couldn't get it, it would have been a no-go. So the, the states were contracted into this whole thing, okay? The people ordained it, but the states contracted into it, okay? This is why the states cannot back out, is because they have a contract that was not allowed to be broken. Okay, now there's some strong argument about the states wanting to, the southern states wanted to break out because the northern states were not playing according to the rules. And the, the southern states wanted to hold closer to the Constitution, and the northern states, who were primarily manufacturing, were more into uh, the admiralty style of operating. So that created quite a, a difference of opinion, a difference of opinion, a difference of opinion, a difference of opinion.